Okay, um, I think we're going to get started. Uh, it's just about 10 o'clock now. Um, so this is the third Invasive Crayfish Collaborative webinar. Um, today it's evaluating, evaluating historic and current distributions of invasive crayfish in the Great Lakes using the Glances Map Explorer with Dr. Uh, Dr. Rochelle uh, Studevant and Nick uh, Boucher. Um, so I'm Greg Hetzroth. I am your moderator for today. Um, so I'm with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, Illinois Natural History Survey. Um, and this webinar is being produced with funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative through the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and so today's speaker, Rochelle, is a program manager for NOAA's Great Lakes Aquatic Non-Indigenous Species Information System, also known as GLANSIS. Her position allows her to work collaboratively with Michigan Sea Grant, Michigan State University Extension, and the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory to understand and combat Great Lakes invaders. She holds a PhD in systems ecology from Kent State University. Nick Boucher is a research associate with uh, GLANSIS. His work on GLANSIS has focused on assessing range expanding and non-indigenous crayfish species in the Great Lakes region. He holds a BA in environmental science from Goucher College and will Steve an MS from the University of Michigan. Um, apparently he uh, submitted his dissertation and was accepted today. So that is brand new news for everybody. Um, and so we are going to um, have people uh, do their questions in the chat function uh, today. So uh, when you mouse over the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a chat function. Um, so send that chat to everybody in the group and we'll ask those questions at the end um, of the presenters. And um, I think that's a about all. So I'll turn that over to Nick and Stuart. I mean, uh, sorry, Rochelle. You muted us, Craig. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Bottom right here. Oh, sorry. No. Uh, in the. There. Yep. There you go. Um. So welcome, everyone. Um. We're just hoping to spend a little time this morning, um, talking about some of the recent things that we've added to the Glances database, uh, with particular regard. To crayfish. I'm going to start us off talking some general background about the database for those of you who may not be familiar with it. And then I'm going to turn it over to Nick to talk all about the crayfish piece. Um, and then at the end, we're kind of going to talk a little bit about gaps. So I have a little piece on some future products um, that might be coming up um, down the road, um, as well as our regular appeal for additional data. <laughs> So for those of you not familiar with the database, GLANSIS is a Great Lakes specific node of the USGS Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database. Um, the data all resides on the USGS servers. Um, it's all the same data that you would get going through the NAS database, but formatted. And when you get into things like the profiles, they're written to a Great Lakes frame, but the basic map data is identical in both systems because it's the same underlying database. But we're also a node-led project to enhance access to information um, and specifically to uh, promote analysis um, from that Great Lakes frame. So GLANSIS provides a simple interface to access the Great Lakes specific content and advanced search capacities. We contain comprehensive technical fact sheets, or we're calling them species profiles, uh, non-native species, uh, and detailed collection records of thousands of reports. Map Explorer is one of our newest features in GLANSIS. Um, Again, it's access to that same underlying data set, but we are partnering with the Great Lakes Aquatic Habitat Framework um, to provide 
um, the capacity to compare um, non-indigenous species distributions such as invasive crayfish or here um, this would be rusty crayfish distribution and to overlay that on different types of base maps. Here this is just the basic default imagery map um, underneath but you can see there's several different types of underlying base maps um, that you could put into play. And then if you go down and select through the surface layers or the shoreline layers, you can add things like shoreline classification or here is GLAF's aquatic ecological units and start comparing habitat patterns and things like that to the species distributions. Um, and Nick will give you more specifically on the crayfish piece of that. Um, we have a quick map feature here to, to generate these maps to select which species you want. Um, Rusty crayfish is one of our, our hot linked quick map species. But we also um, allow you to define your own searches. So you can search by the specific species name, or you can go through and look, um, you know, use this kind of to browse the different taxa. You can restrict your searches geographically. Um, you can um, go right down to the, like a Huck 8, uh, Huck Cove level to look at a specific watershed. Um, you can pull specific state maps. And you can actually select a range of years. Um, this feature can actually be used to generate some animations. I believe the animation Nick will show was actually done by a slightly different method, but using this interface to pull the data. Um, let's, and then I also want to note that if you are wanting to download the data for and bring it into your own GIS database, if you scroll further down that same page, at the bottom you can find all of the information from the database in um, a format that will, it's a comma delimited format that you can copy, paste, and open it in your own spreadsheet or your own GIS database or whatever, and the individual references for every record point on that map are also here to be downloaded so that you have full records for the data um, that you would want to use. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick to talk more specifically about crayfish. Hi everyone. Um, so as Rochelle touched on, my role in this presentation will sort of be to take you all through the, the data that Glances currently has regarding crayfish. Um, I'll conduct a few miniature analyses, hopefully with the idea of giving you ideas of, of analysis that you could do on your own, uh, and then perhaps identify some knowledge gaps, uh, either in our understanding of crayfish in this region, or uh, knowledge gaps that are in the Glances database that maybe you can help us improve. Um, so currently Glances has information on 12 crayfish species. Uh, six of them are uh, watchlist species, species, meaning that they haven't been collected in the Great Lakes region yet. So we have the noble crayfish, which is native to Europe. Uh, we have two species in the Cherax genus, which is from Australia. Uh, we have the spiny cheek crayfish, which is from North America. And then these two at the bottom here, the signal crayfish, which is um, native to the Pacific Northwest region, and the marbled crayfish, uh, which is native to North America. Uh, these are both species that, in our risk assessments, we identified as having high uh, risk of introduction to the Great Lakes um, and high or moderate uh, risk of establishment if they were introduced. So those are sort of at the top of our watch list at the moment. Um, and then uh, to round out our 12, we have six species that are currently in the Great Lakes region. Uh, five of them are range expanders, and the last one is the red swamp crayfish, uh, which is at the moment sort of a, an emerging invader in the Great Lakes states. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, the Glances database, what we mean by range expanders is that uh, they're native to at least part of the Great Lakes region. Uh, but they're either expanding or there's a risk of them expanding outside of their native range. Um, and then so there are actually seven species included in the map explorer. The six that I touched on on the last slide, and then we also have the Viral crayfish. 
Uh, and we currently don't have risk assessments for a species profile for that one yet, uh, just because it's native to just about all of the um, Great Lakes region, except for uh, parts of Ohio. Uh, so there's there's one occurrence of that outside its native range, so it automatically gets pulled into the map explorer. Um, and here we have the summaries of our environmental er, of our organism impact assessments. Since these species are already in the Great Lakes region, we don't assess their risk of establishment or their risk, risk of introduction, but we still conduct a, a risk analysis where we assess their environmental impacts, their socioeconomic impacts, and their beneficial impacts. Um, the crayfish are classified as ecosystem engineers, so they all have moderate or high environmental impacts. Um, the rusty crayfish and the red swamp crayfish are, are classified as having moderate socioeconomic impacts. Uh, and then some of the species that have either uh, research value or, or value as bait or for human consumption uh, also have moderate beneficial impacts. Um, and here I'll just sort of go through the current data that we have within the Map Explorer to examine their, uh, the known distribution of these species. Uh, so here we have the red swamp crayfish. It was first collected in the Great Lakes region in 1967 uh, in Ohio. More recently, it was collected uh, near Milwaukee and Wisconsin in 2013, uh, and then in the past couple of years, 20, uh, since about 2017, it's been collected at a few areas in Michigan. Um, and throughout this presentation, the uh, established collections will be displayed as squares and collected unknown or, or other uh, uh, records uh, are displayed as circles. So that uh, those are just uh, collections or records that we have where we're not quite sure yet if those are established populations or isolated incidents. Um, so this is the red swamp crayfish, as I said. Um, here we have the Procambarus acutus, uh, which is native to the southern lower peninsula of Michigan, uh, as well as southern Wisconsin, uh, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Uh, and it's been collected in New York and uh, near Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, here we have the big water crayfish, uh, Camberus robustus. Uh, it has three occurrences outside its native range. Uh, the two in the northern lower peninsula of Michigan are sort of interesting. They were collected um, by Kelly Smith uh, in 2017 with the Michigan DNR. Um, and those are sort of interesting collections because as we can see in this slide, uh, here we have the orange section is the big water crayfish native range. Um, and just about all of these collections are close enough to their native range that uh, we sort of have to wonder if, um, if they are range expanding uh, or perhaps if, if when the native range was defined, maybe there was some error there. Um, or if, so that, that might be something that we should, should, we should look further into. Um, and I should also mention that this native range is displayed in the USGS map. Uh, we currently don't include it in the map explorer, but that's something that we'd like to maybe later on. Um, and here we have Faxonius immunus, which is uh, native to uh, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Illinois, the lower peninsula of Michigan, uh, southern Wisconsin, and western Minnesota. So it's um, just outside, it, it's just outside its native range in, in western Lake Superior there. Um, and the Viral crayfish, as I mentioned before, it's native to most of the Great Lakes region, uh, but here is an occurrence just outside of its, of its classified native range uh, near Cleveland. Um, and uh, the last one uh, for now would be the um, Faxonius propinquus, uh, which is non-native in western Wisconsin and, and most of Minnesota. So a, a lot of these species that I've talked about so far, um, we don't have very many occurrences for them. So they're either emerging invaders or possibly glances of missing data. Um, and if we are, please let us know. Um, but so that doesn't really display very well the capability of the map explorer or, or what you could possibly do with this data. Um, so now I'll just take a deeper look at the rusty crayfish because we have lots and lots of occurrences. So we have plenty of data to play around with and explore 
what kind of analyses we can do using this, this stuff. Um, so just to refresh, uh, the rusty crayfish uh, is native to the Ohio River Basin, uh, and it has spread outside of its range uh, to, we have currently over 3,000 occurrences uh, in the Map Explorer and the Colensis database. Um, and uh, so as you may notice, a lot of these uh, occurrences are either in the near shore or not in the lakes at all. Um, so many of the layers that the Great Lakes Aquatic Habitat Framework provides are sort of constrained to the, the lakes themselves. So uh, they're not necessarily very useful for examining crayfish. Um, but here we can look at the shoreline classification that Rochelle mentioned earlier. Uh, so this is zoomed in on the um, western Lake Erie, uh, and we can sort of look at what kinds of areas we're finding rusty crayfish. In. Uh, so there's not much of a clear trend in terms of rusty crayfish preferring one type of habitat classification over another, um, except that we do see a higher number of occurrences in areas where there's a tra transition between two habitat classifications. So a lot of these we're seeing, there's an artificial habitat classification and then uh, nearby a coastal wetland or, or a mixed beach or something like that. Um, and that may suggest that uh, there's some sort of habitat that they prefer there, like a, a break wall that provides uh, air to cover for them. Uh, or it could just be that these, these might be areas that are easier to sample or, or for whatever reason there's more sampling going on there. Here in another area that we zoomed in on, you can see once again that uh, there's not really a clear preference uh, in terms of classification, but they do seem to be near areas where there's a transition between two habitat types, uh, except for in the top of the graphic, you see that they're uh, just on a sand beach. Um, and so one of the benefits of Map Explorer that uh, Rochelle talked about earlier is if um, if the data that we're, or not the data, the, the layers that we're providing aren't sufficient uh, for the analysis that you're hoping to do, uh, you can download that data and sort of play around with it yourself. Uh, so here what I did was I downloaded all the occurrences for rusty crayfish and I loaded them into R. And I generated this graphic just showing records by year. So we start um, the earliest records of rusty crayfish uh, in 1897. Uh, and each year it adds in the, uh, the new occurrences for that year. And we can see that they were first introduced in, in Western Lake Erie. Uh, and through various other points of introduction, they've, they've spread throughout much of the Great Lakes region uh, with the highest number of occurrences uh, west of Lake Michigan in Wisconsin. Um, so what does this data really tell us? I also downloaded the data and classified it by hydrologic unit code uh, or the basically the watershed. Um, and I was hoping that this could sort of show the, the leading ed edge of the invasion or something like that. Um, but what's really interesting about this graphic is uh, that we have pockets of areas where there are really high numbers of occurrences right next to watersheds that don't have any uh, occurrences at all. Um, so the highest number of occurrences is in the Wolf watershed uh, in Wisconsin. You can see it in dark red there, um, just west of Lake Michigan. Uh, so there are 108 occurrences uh, listed in glances for that watershed alone. And then right next door we have uh, another watershed that's uh, doesn't have any occurrences at all. Um, so this could suggest that maybe there's not habitat for rusty crayfish in those regions uh, or in those watersheds where we're not seeing any occurrences. Um, but more likely, at least what I think is that there are occurrences of rusty crayfish and, and we just either don't have them or, or haven't collected them. Uh, so these could be identified as areas that maybe we need um, more monitoring in those, uh, in those watersheds, or, or possibly uh, that's just identifying data that Glances is missing. So um, that could be a, a potential knowledge gap uh, just based on what we know so far. 
Uh, and so Glances also tries to provide just basic information that's useful to managers. Uh, so as we're going through this, we've, we've uh, investigated accepted uh, methodology for crayfish management. Uh, so it seems like the, the lowest effort level um, would be biological management by restricting harvest of species that are known to voraciously consume crayfish like smallmouth bass or largemouth bass or things like that. Um, for chemical management, it seems like cypermethrin is, is one of the more commonly used chemicals uh, for crayfish management. Uh, I read a recent study in uh, Norway where they used beta max beth, which is a, a cypermethrin compound uh, to control a, a population of uh, signal crayfish. Uh, but unfortunately, that's really only viable for small isolated bodies of water. Um, and then additionally, uh, for physical management, uh, water drawdowns uh, are used commonly, again, for small isolated bodies of water. Uh, as well as in intensive trapping and removal. Um, and so trapping is one of the more labor intensive methodologies, uh, but, and it's not necessarily effective for uh, eradicating established populations, but there, there have been studies that show uh, ecological benefits to reducing population size, even if uh, complete eradication is uh, not realistic. Um, and so additionally, uh, along with that goes uh, relevant demographics. Uh, so I've been compiling demographics of, of crayfish that are relevant to either their invasion and spread or uh, their management. Um, so for size, we see that uh, the big water crayfish, as its name would suggest, is the, is the largest of the species included in glances. Um, rusty crayfish is, is one of the more fecund species with 575 eggs per clutch. Um, and then also in red, I have some knowledge gaps where we weren't able to find demographics that uh, seem relevant. Uh, and then additionally, I found reports of the rusty crayfish uh, storing sperm. So uh, this is really relevant to their management because uh, they can store sperm uh, and then a potentially a gravid female would be able to uh, establish a population rather than needing multiple individuals to, to form a, a reproducing population. Um, and then for Faxonius immunus and, and uh, Faxonius propinquus, I, I didn't find um, any sources that specifically said that they store sperm, uh, but their life cycle does suggest that they're able to do that. So uh, all Kimber, uh crayfish have the, uh, an organ that'll, that stores sperm called the annulus ventralis. Um, and then in life history studies that I, I read of them, there was a, a gap between their mating season and their uh, when the eggs were laid. So um, we saw that they were uh, mating in the summer or fall, and then they weren't laying eggs until the spring. And I'll uh, send it back over to Rochelle to talk about the uh, risk assessment for learning else. Okay, thanks, Nick. So the risk assessment clearinghouse is our newest feature um, on GLANCES, and there isn't a whole lot of crayfish information here yet, but it is being populated very, very rapidly. Um, the Great Lakes Panel on Aquatic Nuisance Species uh, provided a, an intern who was working over at the Great Lakes Commission, um, who's now uh, at as Class is wrapped up, he, he's transitioned to working full-time um, on going through the priority assessments that were determined by the panel, which includes most of the federal and state agency assessments that have been done for the Great Lakes region, um, as well as some of the bigger national federal agency uh, assessments like Fish and Wildlife Service and USDA. Um, and formatting that data so that our database will be able to read it. Uh, including contacting authors and making sure we aren't messing things up um, as we um, try to put them into a framework. Um, so the, the clearinghouse actually has several different levels. So the first bit I'm going to talk about is just the literature, and this is just a straightforward leveraging of USGS NASA's um, reference database. We went through tagged risk assessment literature with 
the keyword risk assessment and then we can yank them back out. Um, so this is just um, a, a pretty straightforward, but it, it is a, an inroad to the literature and then everything that we add risk assessments to that literature will be included here. Um, then we have a, a, an explorer section that does the methodology. Um, so for all of the assessments that we're going to be including, we first do the, um, a piece on the methods. Um, and you can see here the basic fields. Hopefully you can see the bottom, it's cut off on mine. Um, so just, you know, is this a published method? Um, it, does it consider, you know, which stages does it consider? Is it a peer-reviewed journal article publication or is it an agency report um, or some other type of publication? Uh, the geographic scope, a lot of the um, assessments are framed to US or framed to Canada or framed to North America. There's a handful framed to the Great Lakes specifically. So the geographic scope is really important in understanding risk, risk to where. Um, and then you know, just kind of going through what each of those assessments um, include so that you can do a real quick um, cross comparison between them. Um, and so I just kind of, here's click what you get with a, um, if you click the button to, for a search result on um, crayfish, we have one assessment that's really specific to crayfish that they only assess crayfish, um, one of the better tools for looking at crayfish. Um, there's a citation, there's a link to their actual tool, um, the scope. Um, and then we can also perform a side-by-side -side comparison for this one, I, I went back to kind of like the national or the all taxa level because some of the ones that are assessments for all taxa do include crayfish data. For example, our glances watch list, we have all of our assessments up there. And then U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's ecological risk screening summary also includes crayfish data. So you can go and, you know, see here's two different tools and here's what they did. Um, you can actually download all of the, you know, do your search on crayfish or do the search on all and, and download the whole works at once. Online, you can only see two at a time because that's kind of the limit of, of our screen width. Um, but, you know, to do the side-by-side -side comparison and decide which tool might be the best for, for your purposes. Um, and then we get into the specific results of those risk assessments. And here you can, in fact, you know, pop in your species name if you know which method you were most interested in. You know, maybe you're interested in, um, don't want to do just one species, but you want to do a whole family. Um, and then, again, it's a very similar type of tool where you can do the side-by-side -side comparison. Here we looked at two different assessments for um, Cherix Destructor. Hopefully I said that right. Um, our Noah Glances watch list and then the University of Notre Dame stare. Um, you can see that Glances is actually a Great Lakes specific frame. Notre Dame stare is actually a global. It's based on the biology of the organism, whether it's capable of becoming invasive um, anywhere in the world. <laughs> um, the status here is always going to be relative to that geographic scope. So here we put not established in North America. Um, global, it's established somewhere in the world and invasive. Um, and then you can do the comparison of, you know, different levels they looked at. We are actually working on expanding this so that there's a little more interpretation on some of these that are just numeric scores. Um, one of the first feedback that we got was that that's not terribly useful if you don't know what the scale is. Is that a 0.7 on a scale of 0 to 1 or on a scale of 1 to 100? <laughs> um, so we're working on adding some of that. And again, there, there's an interface here where you can simply download all the data that um, you're interested in and take it um, to your own. Um, these link back to the methods so that you can also then, you know, download the methods papers um, uh, and we'll have the links in here as well for the references. Um, uh, I believe it comes up right below the download data or the actual reference piece. Um, 
so that you can you know download the actual risk assessment files themselves or if a lot of them are each are already online elsewhere then we just provide the URL um, knowledge gaps improvements did you want to talk sure. a about that yeah so I guess a uh, sort of a recurring theme here is is that glance the glances database is really only as valuable as the, the data that we provide and and only as good as the uh, the data that we have so uh, if any of you have seen uh, inaccuracies or or missing data or, or any glaring gaps uh, please feel free to reach out to uh, me or Rochelle and, and let us know we're uh, we're constantly trying to improve uh, the data that we provide um, seems like uh, the one of the uh, higher levels of data that we have would be uh, for rusty crayfish we like I said, we have over 3,000 occurrences, um, but a number of those could use some quality control and quality assurance. Uh, for example, uh, Doug Jensen uh, was kind enough to point out uh, some issues with uh, rusty crayfish occurrences that we have that uh, we're trying to resolve. Uh, we're, we're still working on that, uh, but uh, we do know that there are some improvements that we could have there. Um, and then. One thing that we would like to hear from you is, is what other data can we provide that might be useful to you and the, and the analysis that you do. Um, so as I showed before, USGS has uh, native range classifications for a lot of the species that we've talked about. Um, and that's something that we'd like to include in the future in the, in the map explorer. Um, but if there are any other layers or, or things like that that you'd like to see in the map explorer, uh, that's something that we're we'd love to hear about. Um, and actually, if I could add to that just briefly, um, on the QA QC type thing, one of the pieces that Glances has the capability to serve, but almost no one ever actually sends us the data, is if there's been a management action at a particular site. So right now, you get a dot on the map that says it's here. But there's actually a field where if you've done a control activity, if you, if, you know, this particular site has been sprayed with, um, you know, a chemical controller, there's an active trapping program, we can put that information into this database, but somebody's got to tell us it's happening. Um, and along with that, if a site has actually had a successful control and, and, and the species has been eradicated, um, we sometimes miss that. So, um, it's really helpful if, if those of you in the management community can, can give us that information so that it's shared more broadly. Um, and then, yeah, other data, anything that we can, if there's other types of tools, other types of layers that you think would be particularly useful for us to include. Um, we do have, through the Map Explorer, the capacity to serve model data. Um, anything that's a GIS layer, basically. So if you're aware of papers that have looked at, say, habitat suitability mapping or things like that, or you know, climate suitability or anything like that that would within the Great Lakes frame, um, help us out, point us that direction. We're happy to try to serve that kind of information as well. And then I'll just do real briefly some of the gaps in, from the literature. So this is just a list of the species that we're including on our watch list, the range expander list, and then the established non-indigenous. Um, the first column there is the literature cited. That's what we actually used in developing our fact sheets and risk assessments, um, the stuff that we actually cite. So this was just a real quick look at our, at our sheets and how many references we had. Um, the USGS NAS reference database for most of these species includes additional papers, but you know, somewhat redundant or you know, later reports of the same thing. Um, the USGS NAS reference also includes all of the publications behind individual site reports. Um, so you can see there's a big difference among species. Um, the, the two, the red swamp and the rusty crayfish, um, there have been a lot of studies of those two species, but some of the other species we don't know as much. Um, and then the second, the, the next set of columns, the, the risk assessment unknowns. When we do our risk assessments, they're based on a set of questions. 
Um, and roughly there's, for introduction, there's six questions. And so what I've marked here is how many of those questions as we did our risk assessments could we not answer based on available published literature? Um, the ones in that first column for introduction, um, most of those, uh, the three that are ones and then one of, one of the questions within the Procambrus Phalax were all about the recreational vector. Um, so we really, that's a gap in knowledge, understanding how these crayfish are moving in the recreational vector, particularly aquarium hobbyists, um, but potentially that might also include bait. Um, the establishment section actually has a total of 18 questions. Um, that was much more of a mixed bag, which questions we couldn't answer, but relatively most of the questions we were able to answer um, in that section. Um, the last part there is out of those impact assessments, um, and there's a total of six questions for environmental, six for socioeconomic, and six for beneficial. Um, and again, there's some, particularly some of those watch list species, there's still a lot we don't know. Um, about those species. Um, and all of these, um, did they make it into the current, Nick? Mm -hmm. were, were, were these assessments mostly or will they be in next year's publication? We can They'll provide next year. Okay, oh, so yeah. we'll, we can provide copies of, of those assessments um, to anyone who's interested in knowing specifically what we couldn't answer. Um, to maybe help us out, point us in the direction of additional research or additional papers. And with that, we just want to acknowledge everybody. Um, you know, this is really a communications product. So, you know, we aren't going out there doing the surveys. Um, we have a lot of people um, who share data with us specifically to help pull this crayfish piece together. Um, and then, of course, our glances and USGS collaborators who double check all our work and review our fact sheets. And um, Joe Smith does our programming here to make all of the maps and everything work. Um, so I guess we'll wrap up with that and ask if you have any questions. We can't hear you, Greg. I'm going to remind people if that uh, if you have questions, please type them in the chat function. Um, we haven't had any yet, but I will I will start off with a couple. So uh, some of the species that you have mentioned as range expanders or native species, um, uh, where are you collecting that information from? Because I know Glances gets a lot of their information from the USGS NAS database, but where do you pull native species information from? Um, and the second part of that question, too, would be how would we uh, help you get that information into your database then? Um, like museum records or like is it just a kind of a, a free for all? We just contact you and try to figure out individual ways of getting you that information or? Sure. So the native maps that we use are all coming from USGS NAS. They are actually getting probably 90% of their range, native range data from NatureServe, which is the, the network of um, the nat, you know, Michigan Natural Features Inventory, Illinois Natural History Survey. I forget, each state has, has a program um, that feeds their data into NatureServe. So that's where that data is coming from. If you are aware of specific papers that challenge or outline um, crayfish native ranges. Um, we can manually adjust those boundaries. Um, we have to talk them over with USGS and you know, uh, get their biologists to weigh in as well and, and do that sort of determination. Um, so yeah, if anybody's got that kind of data that we should be considering in, in redrawing some of those boundaries, please let us know um, and we'll get those conversations rolling. Did that answer your question, Greg? Yeah, yeah, more or less. Um, also, so you say data sharers. Um, is there funding for you all to go out and collect this information, or is it more of a passive you are waiting for this information to be sent to you? Um, so I guess, like, 
is there like a bigger picture, like how do we uh, get a bunch of uh, data to you in a better way? Um, the, the needs assessment from the Invasive Crayfish Collaborative kind of indicated that people were very interested in distribution information, um, and especially in one location to better understand crayfish throughout the Great Lakes. And so I'm just wondering, as a collaborative, how do you see us helping you to make a, a database that is um, what people kind of want? So we're actually working on a redesign of, of the, the, the web instructions for how to share data. Um, for individual reports, um, we generally piggyback on USGS NASA's reporting systems. You can just, they've got an online form and you just fill it out. If you have like whole spreadsheets of data or an entire survey, um, you can contact myself as probably the best first point of contact. Um, and then we'd work on it with um, USGS on getting it formatted um, into something that they can bulk upload it like an entire data set all at once. Um, we do have data sharing arrangements already in place with IMAP and BASES and EDMAPS and NISSEN. Um, again, that's through the USGS side. Those get harvested only about once a year, so it depends on whether that timeline is sufficient. You know, for some of the routine resampling resurveys, that probably is sufficient. Um, but if we're really, you know, if, if you've got a report on the invasion front, we would love to hear it sooner than waiting until that automatic once a year update push from, from EDMAPS, for example. Um, and again, th those kind of individual reports are best handled probably by submitting them to USGS NAS through their automated portal. Um, but we're working on getting all that clarified in our instructions online to people interested. We're also still looking for photos. We always love better photos of some of these species. Um, Yeah, did that pretty much answer the question? Just just call me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you have crayfish information, call Rachel. I mean, Rochelle, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, OK, um, we haven't had any other questions. Um, so I'm going to ask a, a question uh, that I'm interested in is iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is a community or um, citizen science kind of driven platform where people go out and they report their um, observations of say crayfish. So where uh, where would something like that fall into the uh, Glances? Like is that, is that something that um, Glances would use in the future? Um, like would you go to iNaturalist or is there data quality issues that um, you see having to be picked apart uh, before that happens, that kind of thing. There are definitely data quality issues. We, I don't believe, have a data sharing arrangement with iNaturalist for that reason, and that most of their reports are not verified. Whereas like EdMaps um, does also have a, have a function for taking reports, but they flag it in their system as to whether it's been verified or whether it's just a random you know, average Joe Schmo sat down and said, oh, I think it's this, and typed it in. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, I think there's a definite role for that kind of thing. I think it's sometimes interesting to look and see if they have data that looks like it would fill some of our gaps. Um, we haven't gone very far down that road, but would definitely be interested in doing it. Um, and then seeing if we could get people out to verify some of those. Again, we don't have the staff to be sending people out in the field or the travel, but um, we're connected to the Sea Grant Network. So I got Sea Grant folks in just about every coastal area of the Great Lakes who could go out and grab a sample. Um, Ashley here at Laurel can identify crayfish if I get them shipped to us on dry ice. You know, so we do have some of those kind of resources where we could, but clearly our preference is if you've got somebody local who can verify those kind of reports and then send it, the data to us, that's our preference over accepting specimens and things like that. 
Okay. Um, let's see. I, I don't have any other questions, but thank you very much for your time. Um, and there have been no other uh, questions that have been submitted. So I think uh, we will um, just kind of, um, I guess, end the conversation here. Um, but thank you very much for your time. And we um, will be uh, taking this webinar and putting it onto our invasivecrayfish.org website. Um, and so you should be able to find the recording in the future. And uh, that's about all. So thank you again, uh, Rochelle and Nick, uh, for your time. And thank you, everybody else, for uh, your, your listening skills. So, um, and with that, I think I will end the webinar. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Take care. <laughs> so what do we need to do? Bye. Nice. Video. And X full screen. Oh uh, yeah, if you can just X out and I'll let you leave. And maybe switch it. Let's try it. Yep. And meeting. Or, yeah. I guess that works. Or meeting.